Perfect. Now I have your number. Thanks. Hey, I'm Robbie Kramer. You're listening to the Leverage Podcast, where we discuss using your social skills to hack dating, travel, finding your dream job, and becoming a complete man. All right, guys, we are back with an awesome dude who he actually interviewed me on a podcast that his wife runs. It's called uh, That Sex Chick Podcast. And he's the founder of what's it called? Sex and Love Co. Correct. Yep. Um, Jordan, welcome to the show. Really happy to interview you because you you were fucking amazing um, when uh, I was lucky enough to be interviewed by you a few weeks ago. So thank you, man. Here. Yeah, I had a great time chatting with you and getting to know you, man. I feel some like-hearted brother from another mother kind of energy. <laughs> totally. <laughs> and um, it was it was funny because I was expecting your wife on that podcast. Uh, Surprise. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I was I was really stoked on our conversation, and we got into some nitty gritty when it came it comes to you know dating and relationships, all that stuff. So wanted to have you on and and hear your story because it sounded mm-hmm. like a. A pretty interesting one. I love your Instagram, by the way. It's uh, the like conscious dot bro is yep. uh, <laughs> Jordan's handle. Uh-huh. Uh, and you just have some funny shit on there. Lots of great content. So anyways, how'd you get into the space? You know, how'd you become like a performance and relationship coach? You know, how'd, yeah. uh, give me the story. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I guess there's like a couple places I could trace it back to. Um, Maybe I'll start with, I moved around quite a bit as a kid. So kind of out of necessity became quite adaptable and a chameleon of sorts. Um, Lived with grandparents, aunts and uncles, um, mom and dad, parents got divorced at a young age, Um, was born into a charismatic Christian church that my grandparents were the pastors of, and then swung the pendulum the other way and moved to Ohio with my mom and kind of like a relatively lower middle class kind of energy in the Midwest. Um, and so through that journey of bouncing around and then moved back to California, um, just kind of figured out how to be adaptable and to fit in um, out of that kind of necessity. And then maybe fast forwarding a little bit in college, I went to San Diego State and I was in a fraternity. So I majored in business, but really I got a master's in frat life. Oh, yeah. And that was a lot of fun. Um, obviously, as you could imagine, you know, there's stereotypes for a reason. Plenty of them were true, and you know, some are maybe embellished. Um, but a really great experience, Scott, to learn a lot about social dynamics and magnetism. Um, I was a social chair for a lot of that time. So I was building really big themed parties um and you know, was kind of the liaison between the sororities, and that was so much fun. I learned so many valuable life skills and then Fast forward beyond that, I think what really kicked me into the intentional personal development space, uh, I started working with a brand called Bulletproof, which a lot of people are probably familiar with, Bulletproof Coffee. Uh, It's a lifestyle brand, nutrition company, all about biohacking and performance. And I got really into that. And I got into that company at the ground level and was able to yeah, just experience a lot, go to a lot of different retreats and um, wellness conferences and, and travel around the country as the national educator. And through that is when I, I really got exposed to, again, the personal development space and became a you know personal health development junkie of sorts. And shortly thereafter, maybe like uh, four or five years into that, I met who is now my beautiful wife. And it was funny because I find that this was true for myself and a lot of people that I work with and that I just chat with about this kind of stuff. Um, sexual personal development is often one of the last places that people will go to. They'll do kind of check all the other boxes, but there's something about that. There's so much, call it like collective cultural trauma and shame. It's, it's just a really tender, vulnerable space to be in. And I was kind of no different in that regard. I was like, ah, you know, I think I'm good enough at sex. I haven't had any complaints kind of deal. I've, you know, had fun with women and I feel like I'm more or less good in that department. And then I got bitch slapped by this beautiful woman who is now again, my wife, where it's like, oh no, there's a whole, a whole new world (laughs) in this area uh, to dig into. And she really 
um, challenged me in that way. And it was, you know, on the one hand, very appealing when I, I met her through Facebook, I actually sent her a voice note on Facebook with a freestyle rap to introduce myself. No really? joke. Part of me cringes at that previous version of myself. Like I've listened to it in more recent years. She played it like at her bachelorette party and stuff. But the stronger part of me is like, wow, bro, that was bold. Like good on you. And it's what sparked our relationship. Um, I got to hear, I got to hear about this. So, uh huh. <laughs> so what, <laughs> that's such an unconventional way to, um, you know, to try to start a, an interaction, I guess, but yeah, yeah. that's, you know, more power to you because it's probably got her attention, right? <laughs> that it did. <laughs> but what made you do that? Where did you get the idea? Was that something you had been doing, um, you know, as, as a, a strategy to meet women before that? So the short answer is no, not really. Definitely using voice notes is something that has been a strong strategy in my just social dynamics, like elevating connection with people in general and certainly with women and using it strategically, not using it all the time because it can be overused. Um, but there's just a, a personal connection and touch point there that I think is really effective. When it comes to freestyling, that is, believe it or not, a personal development practice that is very real. And most people have never freestyle wrapped. And the yeah. idea of it can be terrifying. And so it's something that uh, I actually facilitate at retreats and in my men's groups as like a, again, a personal development practice and it, oh, it gets the sensations going and it's, it's kind of quirky and charming. I don't know that I've ever done it in that specific context of like, you know, picking up on a chick kind of deal, but for mm -hmm. whatever reason, I was just in the flow of life and at that time, and this felt like the right thing to do. And so I went for it and I'll give you a little snippet of what it was. The first yeah. line or two is something like, and dude, it's so cheesy. <laughs> hey, Alexa, I'm about to flex for you. I want to sit next to you. And, you know, and I said a couple more <laughs> things hilarious. and I, and I just owned, you know, I explicitly said to her, I was like, wow, that was so cheesy, but you know, fuck it. I'm going for it. And then said some, you know, authentic words about how I was kind of mesmerized by her and want to get to know her. And a few weeks later, I, f I was living in San Diego. She was living in new Orleans. I flew out there to meet her in person for the first time, stayed with her that weekend, told her I loved her. And it was like, from then on, we knew this was it kind of deal. Crazy. Wow. That's, mm -hmm. that's such an interesting story because it, um, so first of all, did you, how did you notice her on Facebook? So, you know, I don't remember explicitly, but I know myself pretty well. So I imagine when a little something like this, uh, suggested mutual friends, you know, on Facebook, Every sure. once in a while, I'll peruse those. Not so much nowadays, but back then, a little bit more so. Wait, and when was this, by the way? How, this would have been, I guess this would have been about four years ago. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I guess this would have been about five years ago when this happened, but I made first contact about four years ago. So it was, yeah, maybe six to 12 months. I started here, saw her mutual friends, and you know, my thought process was probably a little something like this hot tatted up chick talking about sex. There's mutual friends, ad friend. And then from right. afar for probably again, like six to 12 months, just casually creeping, you know, just liking a post, yeah. maybe saying a little something, but very minimal, just kind of observing from afar before making that bold voice note freestyle. Oh, God. Okay. So you've been following her for a little while. You knew yep. about her content and what yeah. she was. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So that's cool. So it was, it was definitely, you know, some, a, a lot of thought went into it. A lot of thought went into the process of, of, you know, kind of like how to approach her. I, I love the bold move of the freestyle rap. It's so funny. <laughs> yeah. And I'll add one little piece of texture here. So, you know, at that point I was, I guess I would have been like 29. I had been in a long-term relationship in college for almost six years. Somebody that was like the college sweetheart thought I was going to get married. And then it was just like, no, you know, this isn't, I, I got to kind of be free and find myself. And, and those somewhat classic things, I think in particular, maybe for men. Uh, and so I was, I was in a place where I knew and I had, you know, sowed my oats. Is that, I don't know if that's a saying, but like, totally. yeah, that's, yeah. that's what I wanted to kind of ask you next yeah. was about the, you know, the fraternity life. It's SDSU. Yeah. Um, I think we chatted about this last time we talked, we're both from like SoCal. Yeah. Um, I went to UCSD, which nice. was, it, it was, uh, it was cooler to not be in a frat at UCSD. <laughs> 
whatever reason. <laughs> it wasn't. Some schools are like that. Yep. <laughs> well, I was on the golf team, which was, you know, we didn't have the worst reputation. Usually golf teams are kind of like a dorky reputation, but uh-huh. we would always try to go to the state frat parties because those were mm-hmm. renowned as the best parties, the best girls, the best fun time you could have in San Diego. Right. And yep. our Greek play at, at UCSD was just lame. But, you know, SDSU, that was that was all the rage. So. So, yeah, tell us about like, you know, how how you became social chair, because that's that's an amazing position because that puts you, you know, right in the mix of all the the social things going on and meeting all the basically everyone. It it really sort of, I don't know, social proofs you, I guess you could say. Right. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So let's see. I think the way the best way to describe it is, it's kind of what I alluded to before is a lot of my life's journey had sort of forced me or molded me might be a better way to say into being, I'll say likable. I feel like I got really good at being likable. Uh, and I find, I found kind of the art and science of that. And it was just something that, that because of that journey started to come pretty naturally. And then I later on started to realize, Oh, these are like tactics that actually people are, aware of and teach on some level. And I kind of learned them organically. And then I got to refine them when I had more awareness around them and others. And so I think the art of being likable early on, because I actually was social chair as a sophomore, which was unheard of. I actually don't think in recent history, anybody had, it was more of like an upperclassman position, but because of, you know, how I showed up as a pledge, worked hard, was like, you know, memorized the, the rituals and the literature and those things. And, you know, it was, it was very much a hazing fraternity. Um, and yeah, mostly, I have to ask. I'm yeah. sure everyone asked, but like, you know, I love that. So what, what, can you share any of the, like, or maybe just one of the, the worst hazing situations? Sure. So very much, you know, so hazing, the roots of that comes from like the military. So in particular, yeah. like the strongest roots are from people coming back from Vietnam. That's when hazing really got introduced to fraternities in like a significant way. And so as a pledge in a lot of ways, and it certainly depends what fraternity you're in at what school and what culture is there and the history and all that kind of stuff. But it was very much like a boot camp military kind of experience where you're you know going through this for a semester being a pledge um, and then initiating the fraternity so we had like our actual initiation week was very little sleep we're all in one room crammed together um, one meal a day and we're doing like calisthenics and plyometrics and a lot of physical stuff all day and we were uh, upgrading the house so the big fraternity house, uh, that we lived in and owned as an organization, it was like a semesterly thing as part of the initiation for the pledges to upgrade the house in this really challenging week experience. And so that was so special. I mean, it was to be able to dig that deep and to be that physically, mentally, emotionally challenged. Uh, and there was certainly, you know, that's the more light, beautiful part of it. There's some shadow shit, people getting their rocks off. You got 18 to 22 year old kids, um, that some of which are not, you know, mature and equipped enough to hold this kind of space safely and truly deeply effectively. But you have a handful that are usually in the leadership, leadership positions that do know how to do that. And they really can hold the line for that vision. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's some of the tidbits. I'm sure you're still probably really close with a lot of those brothers Absolutely. from that experience, right? Probably from yeah. that, that week, right? Totally. So, Major bond forge there for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's cool because aside from, you know, fraternity life, but we had a little bit of that, you know, with the, like I said, on the golf team and other sporting teams that I've, you know, either friends have played on or I've come across, there's definitely that sort of initiation phase, but I feel like a lot of guys don't really ever have anything like that. And, and I think it's, it's a little bit detrimental to not. So So. agree, man. Yeah. Like really well said, it's that whole hero's journey, rite of passage initiation kind of scenario that a lot of, again, I'll say men in particular are deprived of in society and it's, it's unfortunate. And I get how, you know, the, organizational structures that be are trying to protect, but it's, it's also to a detriment at some point when there's so much sort of coddling and protecting that all of a sudden you get who's supposed to be a man at maybe 20, you know, there's different stages, 18, 20 plus, and they're kind of like boys, you know, they don't, they haven't had to dig deep and 
see what they're made of to like instill that confidence. And, and I think that's so unfortunate and, you know, things like fraternities historically have been able to fuel some of that. And even more before that tribes would have had various initiation ceremonies for young boys stepping into manhood. Some of them even involved like psychedelics, uh, hunting, things like that. And unless you have, you know, awesome parents and, or an awesome community that can hold the line for those things, you maybe don't get it. And hopefully you can just, it sort of finds you on your own. But, um, this for me was one of those big ones, uh, that really catapulted me into being a man, I would say. Yeah. I think, you know, I think a lot of guys, certainly guys that I work with, they tend, if they haven't done something like that, they tend Mm -hmm. to develop later. And, um, you know, it usually takes them, you you know, late twenties, early, mid thirties, sometimes later thirties to kind of come to those same, or get to that same sort of mental stage, you could say, but then yeah. a lot of the guys I know who did play team sports or were in a fraternity, they, they kind of handle that earlier. They sow their wild oats earlier. They handle mm-hmm. a lot of the stuff that guys, you know, come to me later for. So yeah, um, exactly to the point you're making. And dude, when you were in the frat and being like the social chair, um, you know, I'm sure that was just, you know, you're meeting tons of tons of girls, having tons of fun, yeah. you know, making those connections. Um, did you feel like by the end of college, you were like, you know, had had tons of fun, you know, didn't really need to essentially like do all the, you know, chasing after women or what was your kind of mindset after going through that frat experience? Yeah. So I got a good, you know, in high school, I, I started to I got a good chunk of some of that, you know, in the last couple of years of high school, I had an awesome high school experience. You're from the same general area. There was just so much to do there in Orange County. There's so many high schools close together. There's just a lot of opportunity to have fun and to learn and to connect with people and to be social. And then that got kicked into hyperdrive in college. Um, so the first like year and a half of college, I had a lot of that. And then I found my college sweetheart at the time and fell in love just such an amazing woman. I'm so grateful for that season. And, but, you know, then the last essentially three and a half years, cause I did the, the super senior year in college in five years. Nice. I, wish, I, I wish I would have stayed 10. <laughs> doing, doing five years was the greatest decision ever. Like, you know, they yeah. made me redshirt as a, as a freshman golfer. And uh-huh. I was like, Oh, I came in with some AP credits. I don't want to be here five. And I, I wish I could have stayed six or seven, you know, yep. hundred <laughs> like, percent. <laughs> so good. And so, you know, the second half plus of college, I was in a relationship and I was faithful in that relationship. And, you know, I was still very involved in the fraternity and still had a great experience, but I was in an awkward position where I didn't know how to be friends with women, especially if I had any level of attraction to them. And so I, I avoided, I, I more or less just avoided. I felt like it was wrong if I had an attraction then I like, I couldn't have any relationship with them whatsoever. So like my girlfriend's friends, it was very surface level. I felt very uncomfortable and awkward in myself. And it actually, I sort of backtracked in my confidence when it came to women specifically during that season. Uh, So, you know, that was almost six years. And so coming out of that after college, a couple years out of college, I guess I would have been like maybe 24, something like that. um, I found myself while I was still very social and likable and the guys loved me, I had lots of amazing, great friends and that community and the brotherhood was wonderful. And I think the, the women liked me in theory, but I just felt uncomfortable and I could be social and charismatic enough to where there was connection there, but to have it turn into a dating romantic kind of thing, I, I felt just very out of practice and awkward. And so it took me probably, that relationship for yeah. so long and you, yeah, that's interesting. I, uh, I like the way you put that. Cause I'm, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of guys in that situation, but I've never, I've never thought about that before until you just brought it up where, yeah. cause I, you know, I'm, I'm in a committed relationship now uh, I'm engaged and, mm-hmm. and yeah, there is that, that sort of awkwardness or something. Cause you know, there, you could feel some sort of attraction and you, you know, it's like, well, what do you do with that? Obviously nothing, but it's still a weird space to be in. So I can yeah. relate. Yeah. Yeah. And a and couple of things, course, if, if you end the relationship, then you're kind of, 
it, it puts you in this kind of no man's land because like I haven't been pursuing that for so long, right? Yeah. And then, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And actually a funny little quick story comes to mind. I was connecting with this young woman who was just gorgeous. There were so many little synchronicities on how we met and, and threads of connection too. And <laughs> I could not bring myself to make a move because I was so terrified of being rejected because I was so out of that practice of that muscle yeah. of, of, you know, hacking the fear of rejection so she actually stayed at my house one night, stayed in bed with me, and I did nothing. I didn't even, you know, I don't even think I put my arm around her kind of a thing because I, th I knew that she was kind of seeing another guy, but they definitely weren't in an exclusive relationship. And something that I've heard said that I kind of subscribe to is most desirable women are in some sort of relationship, I use in air quotes, with a man. There, there's something there. Maybe not an Always. exclusive boyfriend, girlfriend, but they're yeah. dating someone. They're they're, you know. So that was just me I, being in fear and scarcity and that kind yeah. of thing. And come to find out, it was, I don't know, probably at least two, three years later, I had an explicit conversation with her about that. And she was like, oh, I was waiting for you to make a move and make no mistake that <laughs> night and that conversation, I made a move and it was awesome. And we had a beautiful, Oh, you got a second chance. I got I a made... second chance. Those are rare. Yes. Those are, they yeah. are rare. And I was very grateful for that. <laughs> Cause I have so many stories where, you know, I think back and like, oh my God, I should have made the move. I had girls write in my like high school yearbook. Like, why didn't you make the move this time? And I was like, well, what about now? <laughs> like, no, nah, it's too late. You missed the boat. Yep. <laughs> it was sailed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> so, so she, she told you that, or sorry to cut you off, but yeah, yep. continue with it. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so she told me, she's like, I was waiting for you to make a move. And I shared just where I was at and she kind of more or less knew, but I was just more open and explicit with what was going on in my head and my heart and in my life. And, and there was this moment where it was so romantic, bro. We we're on the beach in San Diego having this conversation and and I just, you know, made the move as, as it became clear, oh, that spark, that attraction, that connection, that spark is still there. Even, you know, a couple of few years later made the move and we had an awesome night together and had a little fling. It was, you know, it wasn't meant to be, and we just weren't aligned fully in lifestyles and, and whatnot. But that was part of, you know, at that point I had now been a couple, two to three years out of the relationship and had gotten much more practice and much, and I'd built up that confidence once again in this new container. Cause you know, it's one thing to have confidence living in a fraternity house where women are kind of coming to you and the structure is very conducive to yeah, having a lot of built to bring yeah. those needs in. Right. And then exactly. Yeah. What was it like? And, and how did you overcome, you know, not having that structure and having that kind of lack of confidence as I draw my mic here, <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> um, you know, from the story with the girl from two years prior. Yeah. So like we mentioned, so in the fraternity, I had, we had this structure. It was, it was, you know, you still had to work for it, but it was also like, they came to you. It was just very, it was much more accessible in a college setting and in that particular setting. And then and it was like, okay. For you too, because you're actually doing the, you're doing the work to get them to come. So you kind of know them from yeah. the get go where you know, the people that know, you know, that's like the ultimate position to be in. Right. Totally. And I'll just maybe pause at, at that part for a second. Cause something I want to like speak to a little bit is something that I got really, that I learned as social chair and in the fraternity where I was like being public is being willing to take risks and being really playful, doubling down on playful and humor and developing that skill. And like, I remember the very first time I did walk arounds, this is a thing where every week the fraternities would all go to the sororities and they would make announcements at, you know, a handful of sororities that were like the top sororities. And I remember the first time I went, I was terrified. I was, I mean, my heart pitter pattering like a motherfucker. So just in my feels, and we did like a little skit and I remember just stepping up and, you know, that classic feeling the fear and doing it anyway. And it just opened up a whole world of possibilities of like, if I, instead of running from my heartbeat, I actually run toward it and, and you know, recognize that these emotions are signals from my soul that something is important. You know, it's a bit of the fight or flight, but yeah. it's like, oh, 
and I started to, and, and didn't know how the language around it at that time, but I started to rewrite my story around those sensations where, oh, this elevated heartbeat is not inherently a bad thing. This like shortness of breath, the dry mouth, all those things that kind of come with a high pressure situation. These are not bad. In fact, in certain settings and probably even most in the modern day, they are potentially a good thing if I can see them as such and leverage that intensity instead of being hijacked and consumed by it. And as I had that shift and, and recognized that, that just has served me so much in my life ever since, you know, 10 plus years, 15 plus years later. Yeah, I love that because it's, you know, we're, we live in such a comfortable culture, you know, everything yeah. is designed to make us comfortable, feel good, right? And a lot of the time when we, it, it's rare to kind of have those situations arise. And mm-hmm. I think, as you said, it's the normal reaction is to kind of back off or like, oh, what's wrong with me? Why am I getting nervous? That yeah. shouldn't be happening. But it's like, no, that is an opportunity mm-hmm. to move towards that fear, as you mentioned. And um, yeah, I, I, I kind of came to that same reframe, you know, back in the day when I was, you know, doing a lot of personal growth work and, and, you know, just also from approaching women, you know, that, that anxiety yeah. you have, you see someone you want to talk to and like not doing it. And then it's like, yep, no, yep. that's, it's, it's not, you know, it's not fear. You can, it's like getting on a roller coaster. You could be scared or you could label it as excitement because totally anxiety and, and excitement is just, you know, the same side of the opposite side of the same coin, I think. So, yeah. And, you know, there's so many experiences where I regretted what I didn't do as opposed to, yeah, sometimes I'll regret what I did do, but I will always regret what I didn't do. And to your point of like talking to a woman that I have like attraction to or interest in, you know, there's those handful of times that we all have, especially as men, where we're like, man, there was an opportunity there. And I just, I let my fear and excuses and stories you know, overtake me instead of taking that inspired action where, yeah, I might've been rejected or I might have found the love of my life, you know, yeah. like, oh, or at the very least, just had an awesome interaction. Right. Uh, and so, yeah, those kinds of, of pivotal experiences really helped, um, yeah, remind me that this is an important perpetual practice to stay committed to. Uh, so, maybe coming back to outside of the fraternity, this new setting, rebuilding mm-hmm. my confidence. What really sparked it, the, this next season and this iteration of my growth and development and confidence and, and women in particular is, you know, I was working a post-college job in a market research firm as a marketing manager, you know, putting my marketing degree to good use, thinking I was, you know, doing what I'm supposed to do. And I'm really grateful for that opportunity. And it became clear after a couple of years, this is not it. I have to do something else. I don't know what that looks like, but I know that I need to radically change things. And right at that same time, the relationship with the college sweetheart was coming to an end. And it was in a lot of ways, my world was crumbling. Um, The fraternity, I'd actually become chapter advisor of the fraternity in way over my head as like a young man trying to do that, taking over somebody who'd been doing it for like 40 years, but just feeling like I still wanted to be a part of something because I was in this awkward in between. And they were actually getting kicked off campus for hazing. And I was even potentially facing criminal charges for knowing about it and not doing anything. <laughs> and so this is all happening at warp speed with me. And well, so, so I decided to break up the legal yeah, rest, yep. the job change. Damn. Yep. Yeah. And so I decided I'm going to quit my job. I actually, I read the four hour work week, work week by Tim Ferriss. It was the first book I ever read for leisure as an adult at like 25, something like that, 24, 25. And it just like kind of detonated a bomb in my mind. Whereas like, oh, the, there are possibilities beyond what I like have seen. And so I used tactics from that book to, and I leveraged it to negotiate a remote working situation with that job in the interim while I was like transitioning out. And I sold everything I owned and started living out of my car with my pit bull Biggie. So nice. Biggie and I for almost a year traveled around the country, stayed with friends, relatives. And that was when I also discovered Bulletproof Coffee and the Bulletproof blog, website, podcast, lifestyle, all that kind of stuff, and got really into it. And you know, I sent them a video of, they had an opening in the marketing department. This is again, very early on. They had a handful of employees. Uh, they had a job opening for a junior marketing assistant, not just a marketing assistant or a junior marketer, but a junior marketing assistant, like a double negative glorified internship, which I felt, you know, 
in my ego overqualified for, but I was like, dude, I will scrub toilets to work, to be a, you know, associated with a brand like that. It's something that I believe in and I'm passionate about. And so I made them, I made a funny five minute video of why they should hire me and spliced it all up. And it was, I changed outfits in every little spliced part of it. I had Biggie in it, my dog. I, I was just very silly and playful and sincere. And I got hired as a result of that. And that helped spark my confidence, right? I had taken a risk. I was tapping into my creativity, um, doing something unconventional and having this opportunity with an unconventional brand. It was just all these things were happening now where I was taking radical inspired action, quitting job, living out of car, going for this thing. And so then confidence started to build that was translating in kind of all of my life. Um, So I'll pause there, but that was a big catalyst for me. Definitely. That's cool. I see the the slight correlation there with the uh, getting the job and, and, you know, (laughs) getting your wife with the creative content. (laughs) <laughs> you know, pushing totally that. <laughs> <Gotta> stand <laughs> like out, that. you know, funny enough, just a side story about Bulletproof. I had never really heard about the brand. I think it was in shit. What year was this? I, I was speaking at a convention and Dave Asprey, he's the founder, correct? He was, yep. he was also speaking. Um, and I remember seeing this like weird looking guy wearing these like wrap around, like bike riding, <laughs> but like they look like accountant, like with that, with like the yellow sort of accountant slash bike rider glasses, and he was dressed the blue blockers. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, who's this fucking weirdo? <laughs> like, I thought it was like another participant, like watching this conference. It was called the 21 Convention. It was a bunch of like young guys trying to, you know, kind of life hack. Um, uh-huh. And then I was he like he's like next up we have Dave Asprey and I'm like oh is that this guy's a speaker who is this guy right and then I started listening I'm like holy shit this is amazing he's like a biohacker and brilliant that's when I first heard of Bulletproof um yeah and now I think it's a household name almost yeah I had I mean I can't say enough amazing things about that opportunity that season of life traveling around going to a lot of events like what you just described um, and just the people I was exposed to, the opportunities I had. And I shared with you when you were on me and my ladies podcast, you know, hacking the fear of rejection. I did uh, probably thousands of bulletproof coffee demos in every kind of setting imaginable. And, you know, rinky dink grocery stores in the middle of nowhere to like, you know, high performance mastermind experiences. So I just got to be exposed to so many people um, in this very casual, connective, fun way. And that supported me a lot in my growth for sure. That's amazing. Yeah. So you were, you were helping to, so you're in the marketing department, obviously helping to spread the word about Bulletproof and yep. forcing, you know, you're, you're essentially like, you know, you, you have to constantly be putting yourself in a rejection yep. <laughs> based situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also I wanted to just kind of mention it, it around, it was probably around the same time because we're close in age, right? I'm, I'm 39. Mm-hmm. How old are you? 33. Oh, okay. Got it. So the, I kind of went through a very similar transition. I, I had my first job at a university was, uh, in banking. I hated it. Um, and then 2008 happened and, uh, lost the job and was like also out of a relationship. And I had that same sort of experience, um, where I was like, you know, not sure what to do, yeah. where to go. And that's when I started this business and kind of took a risk similar to what you were talking about. And I think that probably comes up a lot for guys. And I'm so glad at that point in my life, I could have tried to get another job that I hated, like working in sales at a, another investment bank. But, you know, there was, I don't, I don't I, maybe it was from some of the personal growth training I was doing or whatever, but someone was like, listen, if you start your business now, you've already kind of been you know, blogging about, you know, dating advice and that sort of thing. If you start it now and it doesn't work out, you can always go back to the other thing. Right. Um, so, you know, I just saw the similarity there and that was, I love that philosophy. And and I'm glad you said that because it, it reminds me of where I was at, where I told myself, I will, I will work in like a, a bar or a restaurant or something like that before I go back to like a corporate desk job. That was just, for me, that was so clear and true. I was so grateful for that experience and things I learned, but I was like, I need to be with people. I need to be 
communicating and social and all those kinds of, that's just like a part of me that I, I need for, it's just like a hunger. And I know for my, my growth and development, that is such an important thing. I'm mm-hmm. not saying it always has to be that way for everybody, but I think there's an element of that that's so important and can be missing, especially in you know finance world and, and those desk jobs for a guy who's you know wanting to find to date, to find maybe the love of his life, to experience that kind of connection, you're definitely out of practice at least 40 hours a week of your life. And nowadays, a lot of people working from home, and don't have a choice in a lot of ways. It's like, oof, you're not flexing that muscle and honing in on that skill and, and just experiencing that connection and that fulfillment that can be really tough and tough to get out of. Yeah, totally. Um, it's so true. And the kind of what you said also about the four hour work week, that was one of the first books that I read too, that kind of yeah. opened my eyes to just a different way of thinking. Mm-hmm. And after that, there was no way I could even ever have a boss again, like it yeah. just ruined, which is thank God it did. Cause I'm like the worst <laughs> <laughs> I'm a terrible boss for myself, but I'm an even worse employee, but, <laughs> but I wanted to, to circle back to, um, you know, you mentioned when you met, you know, your wife mm-hmm. that, you know, you thought you had the sex thing kind of down, but then uh-huh. you're like, Ooh, maybe <laughs> there's some other shit going on here. Can you tell us more about that? And that yeah. whole experience? Cause I, I'm sure like, you know, I, I've, I've had some, some similar experiences with, with some really cool women as well. Mm-hmm. Um, actually when I was in, I was in like the swinger scene for a little while. Mm-hmm. And I remember a specific incident where, we were like me and my, my girl were swinging and this dude made my girlfriend squirt. And up until that point, yeah. there was like, <laughs> she didn't even know she could squirt. We had tried a bunch of times and he was just like, you know, bam. And yeah. um, I was like, holy shit. <laughs> How was some- that for your ego? <laughs> yeah. That was a tough pill to swallow, but uh, <laughs> he showed me how to do it. So at least I got the, uh, <laughs> the, the learnings from it, but, but nice. yeah, so it's, I like that you bring up the ego part. Cause, cause that can be definitely like a, a huge ego shattering sort of moment to be yep. like, okay, here's a, here's a woman who knows more about sex maybe than I do, or who can, you know, teach me a bunch of things. And a lot of sh- that can bring up so much shit for guys. Um, you know, because we're, we're kind of taught, like I should be good at this, but no one really trains you how to be good at it. No one, you know, or you should just learn from porn. So yeah, yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of this stuff. Yeah. So, you know, equal parts, intriguing and terrifying, you know, connecting with her. Um, and as it goes in the first handful of months up to a year or maybe more, there was that just incredible honeymoon phase chemistry connection which can make up for a lot, you know, of the more of the tactical, maybe more sustainable type of stuff and energetic things that go into a more long-term relationship. Um, but at some point that came up and it was probably about, yeah, around six months into the relationship, I noticed that my, my advances were not being as, as well received, not as eagerly received. And so I started to get a little self-conscious and wonder, you know, what's going on here. And, you know, bless her heart. She tried her best to communicate, but she just couldn't quite put the words to it. And, you know, there's a lot of things involved in this, but there was one pretty pivotal thing that we did that opened up a whole new realm of possibilities in my sex life and how I show up as a lover. And it was this, um, this quiz called the erotic blueprint quiz. Have you ever heard of it by any chance? Mm. It's amazing. Uh, highly recommend checking it out. It is basically the love languages for sexual intimacy. Mm-hmm. This is something developed by this lady, Miss Jaya. And it, I'll do a quick little overview of what it looks like. So if you're familiar with the love languages, you can very sure. well translate them to this. But you know, the love languages for me is you know, in the early personal development days when I learned what mine were and started to understand what my friends and like siblings, dad, those kinds of things were, it was like, oh, I could see where there were points of disconnection or misunderstanding because I was trying to love someone with acts of service, which is like my number one love language. But my brother, for example, I remember at a personal development retreat we were at together that we actually were hosting together. We went through this and he, I was trying to show him I loved him in this way, but he didn't even acknowledge it. And I was resentful and I didn't even really know why. And that illuminated this. So that context said, 
bringing it back to the erotic blueprint, come to find out. So there's five, right? There's sexual, sensual, uh, kinky, energetic, and shapeshifter. And without getting too much into them, you can probably on some level just by the word, just like with the love languages, deduce what they mean. I Certainly can, there's I can deduce all but the shapeshifter one. You'll have to- so shapeshifter is like you're kind of all of them. You you okay. you're you're able to morph and be a lot of them. Like you experience love and intimacy and connection with all of them in some way or another. Um, and there's there's shadows to all of these too, right? There's the light side and then there's the shadow. So come to find out, we took this quiz, you know, her being in that space, she knew about this tool and resource. And my top two were her bottom two and her bottom two were my top two. And so one might look at that and be like, oh, fuck, we are sexually incompatible. This is doomed, you know, quit while you're ahead kind of thing. But me being, you know, a biohacker of sorts and just a life hacker, I'm like, well, no, no, no. This is actually an amazing opportunity. Our ceiling for intimacy is so high and it's a righteous path that I'm excited. You know, obviously there still feels that come up and it's challenging, but I'm excited to embark on this journey. And she was very much of the same mindset. And so, you know, fast forward three and a half years later now, we have it's you know a long game, doesn't happen overnight, but I continue to uncover the the mystery of her and her sexuality. And she does the same for me. And because we're so curious and committed to that path and love one another and, and respect one another and want to give and receive pleasure um, for our life partner, we've just continued to unpack that. And even this this past weekend, we had a very novel experience that was very much inspired by the erotic blueprints. She, her top two are kinky and energetic. And, you know, in the past for me, kinky, I had so many judgments around that. Um, certainly had, was intrigued in certain parts, but I, you know, I, I imagine the leather lace whips and chains and like BDSM, Dom submission, sadomasochism, all this kind of stuff. I'm like, those people are fucked up, you know, <laughs> that, that, there's something wrong with them. There's psychological problems. And yeah, to be fair, there's some of that, but a lot less, it's way more of amazing stuff that I just didn't understand and couldn't, had never been really been like exposed to that when yeah. you're in like more of the mainstream, like I'm sure there's not a lot of frat brothers being like, yeah, let's go to this BDSM event. You know, it's, it's totally not really <laughs> like the vibe, right? <laughs> so, exactly. I was the same way too. Like I remember going to like some crazy San Francisco after party and there was like some guy in like a saw horse and people in like leather. I'm like, I'm fucking out of here. This is <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. No, I can relate. A, there's a ton of cool shit. If you do get into that, you know, that, that subculture and start to understand it, which I did many years later, but yeah, you know, I digress. So continue. With yeah. That. And so something I'll say around all of this is I have found that as I've dived more into this element, this area of personal development, sexual personal development, it so strongly translates into the rest of my life. Um, an example, right? Dom sub dynamics. Judgments might come up for somebody that's listening to this as it did for me when I heard Dom sub. I was just like, oh, that's kind of like weird, dark dominance, dominating someone, submissive, submissive. You know, that all just was like, oh, there's something that feels, you know, like patriarchy esque in there and like, you know, bad, dark stuff. You can say it like this follower, leader. That's something that I and a lot of people can connect to a lot more easily. It's the same thing. That's that is the yeah. core of what Dom Sub Dynamics is. Is there's a follower and there's a leader, and the the follower willingly follows the leader, you know. And the leader is somebody who has a you know righteous responsibility to lead the follower in a in a good way, you know, in an integrous way. And so, for us, as I've learned about Dom Sub Dynamics, follower leader dynamics in our relationship. That translates to my business, to how I coached, how I show up in the world of being, you know, a, a leader that's in integrity and that is um, taking this responsibility very much to heart for people that follow me. Like I don't take it lightly. I don't do it all loosey goosey. It's something that I I want to make sure I'm I'm doing it well. And so training in that area really translates outside of it. Whereas I I found this is my experience. A lot of people I work with. It doesn't translate as strongly the other way. General personal development doesn't translate into the bedroom as strongly. 
Um, right. So that's definitely a big learning I've had for sure. Yeah. The um, I was curious, what were your two languages? Sexual and sensual. And so sexual is the very like sort of what you, the quintessential Hollywood pornography. It's like P in the V, tits uh-huh. and ass, you know, cock and balls. That, <laughs> that kind of stuff is what like ha- turns me on very seamlessly, very like organically, naturally. And a lot of that, you know, the theory is, is fueled by men in particular being exposed to porn. And I jerked off to that shit, you know, every day since I was like 10 years old uh, until, you know, maybe like a decade ago. And so that's, that's what my primary is. And as, and maybe the last thing I'll say here for now is we actually took it again recently, that same erotic blueprint quiz and my things have shifted. I'm still in sexual number one, but my percentages breakdown has much more evened out. So now that I've experienced different elements of kinky and energetic, I now acknowledge them, recognize them and appreciate them and enjoy them. And so, and same with Alexa, hers have, have shifted a little bit as we, you know, we're ever evolving beings and creatures. Same thing with the regular love languages. Those have shifted for me at certain seasons of life, depending on what I'm craving, what I'm experiencing, that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. I've noticed that as well for my love languages and, and uh, I can definitely understand how that would happen sexual, sexually as well. So mm-hmm. did, did you guys, once you kind of figured out that you were kind of the, not the opposite, but totally different. Did yeah. you guys then like come up with just different things you could do to kind of, you know, marry those concepts together or what was that yeah. process? Yeah. So kind of, <laughs> you know, with awareness comes choice. So it's like, all right, cool. We have awareness. Now we have a choice to do something about it, but what do we do? Like it's, it's literally on some level learning a different language, you know? And so it has very much been a long game. And this is something that I am so, I make sure to communicate with people that I work with and, and people that are in our programs and stuff is this does not happen overnight. There will be especially if you're committed to the long haul path of this, there will be breakthrough transformational moments that change everything, but those are few and far between. And it's, it's the long game of ch- long game of chipping away at it where things will become clear. Things will click and you'll start to just understand and appreciate and be able to deliver in various ways. Um, so that being said, we just continue to our, immerse ourselves in this world. And I'll say we, me in particular, because she had been more immersed in it. And, you know, we have the same challenges that all couples have. Just because we're in this work doesn't mean that we're immune to the challenges that come up in coupledom and in sexual intimacy. And so it was, you know, going to like one of the big breakthroughs for me, we went to a Tantra meets BDSM uh, weekend long course. And we actually ended up doing two rounds of it, like a level one and level two. And so I started connecting with people, with experts in various domains to like immerse myself into those worlds. Those kinds of immersive experiences, you know, a weekend where you're with people that are all in this together, those in my experience have the most transformation, you know, talking about like men's work. There's a group called Sacred Sons that does amazing immersive men's weekend experiences. Um, and yeah, so those were big for me and both of us being just committed to that path, having coaches, reading books. Uh, and we also have this thing called relationship board meeting that every week we actually go through like a checklist and we have a shared calendar and we schedule sex. We schedule different kinds of sex. That's so like cool. one little example I'll give you, that's a really good one is, well, maybe a couple I'll give is we have King and Queen worship. So every other week, generally speaking, we'll alternate. So let's say this week is king worship. Next week is queen worship. In king worship, she creates an experience for me that I just get to step into. So you could say that she is the dom and I'm the sub on some level in that, right? She's the leader, I'm the follower. And so for one to two or so hours, we have this chunk and she creates a scene slash experience for me. Maybe it's like a, a cock worship scenario where she just gives me a full body massage and worships my cock and my, my, you know, my sex organs. And it's beautiful. And so that's like one example. Then the following week, I'll do something for her. And another example that's is great. it's I so great. And yeah. having it scheduled 
so that it's it's not left up to chance and spontaneity. And I had my judgments right. around this stuff early on. I was like, what do you mean scheduling sex? If I have to do that, something's probably wrong. It's like, no, 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 no. That just means you are proactive in showing the universe and your relationship. This is a priority that I'm going to prioritize. Yeah. Um, and not just leave it up to chance. There's so much shit going on in life. So many urgent things that are coming my way that oftentimes important things, because they're not urgent, they'll just you know, sit on the back burner indefinitely. Um, and you just yeah. see that so often with relationships, you know, everyone's like, oh, we lost a spark or this or that. It's like, well, in any long-term relationship, like in the beginning, of course, sex is going to be exciting and new, yep. right? But mm-hmm. just like anything, as it continues and it becomes normal, it can mm-hmm. so easily lose that spontaneity. So, but then you do have to have some, you know, you have to actually like put some, uh, intention behind totally making it a priority, making it something that you still like, maybe you don't just naturally want to like explore like you did in the beginning. But if you, if you do that intentionally, you can have that same sort of experience and that the same upside from that, I think. Yeah. And it, you know, instills confidence. I have so much more confidence now that I can create an experience and set a scene for her where she is turned on, like, you know, very authentically turned on. Uh, and there's, there's novelty present that creates that passion and that desire. Um, whereas, you know, there's a point in time where in our relationship in the first year, I, I was like at a loss. I was like, I don't know what to do here. It's, you know, for me, sex is so clear. It's just, it's hasn't, it's, it's not challenging. And then I was like, oh, there's so much more opportunity to have pleasure outside of how I've seen it in the past. And she's just been an incredible mirror and muse for me to, you know, help me step into my greatness and step up my game in that way. Yeah, that's that's such a cool like process and like transformational experience to go through. Yeah. Um, especially with a partner. So yeah. Right. And you guys work with couples to to kind of facilitate those same sort of results or what do you guys do specifically? Yeah, we do. So we have a few different things that we offer. We have, you know, coaching the coaches. So we have like a certification process for people that want to become sex coaches or want to add sex coaching to their, their practice that they don't currently have. Um, so that's one, that's one of the bigger parts of our business. And then we have certainly just one-on-one and or couples coaching. And then Lex and I also have a program called Couples Goals, which is kind of like you could say a mastermind for all-in kind of couples, couples that are looking to optimize their relationship. They're fully committed and they acknowledge that there's more and they want support to get that more. So we're actually in the middle of a round of that right now. And it's an eight-week experience. We meet once a week and then we have, you know, a Telegram thread that we connect in, and it's a very interactive, immersive kind of experience, where we're we're kind of showing you the buffet of what's possible in this realm. So, Kink One Hundred and One, Tantra One Hundred and One, BDSM One Hundred and One, like giving you a taste of all these and giving you very, um, like, really practical tactics to be able to start on this journey. Whether it's breath work, it's eye gazing, some of these, the stuff that people have never done that can so support intimacy. Oh yeah. Um, eye yeah. gazing, especially if, if amazing. Uh, you're listening to this and you never tried eye gazing, you know, when you see it, you'll be like, what the fuck? This is weird. But when you do yep. it, <laughs> <laughs> it's like psychedelic and wild, yeah. super connective. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we'll do like little spanking tutorials, just like very light stuff. Um, using the number system of one to 10 on like impact play and on how connected you feel to someone and just having those, that structure so that you can have the feel empowered to create something novel and, and, ha- and not do, do just kind of randomly and throwing it together, but you actually can pull from this buffet of things, you know, and you can go deeper, you know, into a course or something that goes really deep into any one subject that we just scratch the surface on. Yeah. That's, that's, that sounds like an amazing course. It's, uh, Really cool. I I mean, I, there's so many couples, like every couple would basically benefit from that. Totally. Yeah. Dude, Mm -hmm. thanks so much for, uh, you know, coming on and sharing your wisdom. Um, so how can people find out about that? How can people Mm -hmm. connect with you and find out about the other stuff you guys are working on? And then of course, um, you know, the podcast, 
you know, mm-hmm. drop, drop the goods. <laughs> drop the goods. Yeah. So on Instagram is definitely where I'm most active at conscious.bro. If you haven't gathered, that's kind of my persona and how I show up. It's a very fun way. It's the way I play. Um, my lady is at that sex chick and that's her brand. And, and the podcast is called that sex chick, which I am a part of pretty frequently as well. And then our company is sex and love co. And so we're actually in the process of rebranding, maybe by the time this publishes, depending on when it does here in a few weeks, um, sexandlove.co is going to be live, our new website, which is going to have all this really amazing stuff on there and such a cleaner, easier way to follow. And yeah, and you can find all of our programs and things we offer through Instagram, through the website and the like. Man, I, I uh, you know, wish we had more time as yeah. just like last time, was, yep. uh, <laughs> you know, we have such a similar story. So it's always fun chatting about all this stuff. So yeah. thanks so much for, uh, for coming on and, you know, opening up and having the conversation. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, man. This is really fun. Thanks for listening. If you want more, go to innerconfidence.com and don't forget to subscribe to this podcast for the latest episodes.